There was a lady named Dodie Goodman, and she and a man named Sam Root both were in wheelchairs. Both were hideously handicapped, both were members of this writer's group, and we would often meet in their home, because it would be easier that way, and she was a great hostess. And seated in a, in a wheelchair, she had equipped her kitchen and everything, and she could run her thing there. And they were friends of Loring Mandel, who wrote for Playhouse 90, and friends with, uh, what's his name, uh, the playwright, uh, who was another uh, Playhouse 90 writer. Anyway, here was this young lady and this man. So I would go to this writer's group every weekend, every week, and carry along my pages and read, lift and read their pages out loud, and I would read my pages, and we would react to each other. And it was part of my educational process was trying to utilize several writer's groups, one of which Ray Bradbury had going, and I would go there also. Anyway, I was coming home from the, the, the meeting, and suddenly I found myself thinking about children's games, kick the can specifically. And I was sort of going over in my mind the, the rules of the game. And then I got myself confused with uh, hide and seek. And then I got myself a little confused with a game called statues. And all of them are children's games that involve counting and searching. And the kick the can, and when, you, when people run in and kick the can, and then uh, and I couldn't quite get it together in my memory, and I was thinking, my God, George, you're not yet 30 years old, and you've forgotten your childhood because you played this game a hundred times. In the gloaming, you've got so many nostalgic, wonderful, warm memories about what it was like to be just as the soft dark would come. It wouldn't be yet dark. Few shadow, people would be just sort of shadows moving in the darkness, and, and at a certain distance, they would vanish, but it was soft, and it was warm, and it was the children's voices ringing all through the streets and, and the parents with the lights on in the windows and the radios on inside the houses. And it was a very warm and beautiful scene I had in my mind. And at the same time, I'm finding myself remembering that I can't remember the rules. Then I thought, my God, if, what, what if I was in an old folks home? And I immediately thought of a little short story, which is in this book. And I put it in this book because I had this little short story in my mind when I went to visit the Twilight Zone to talk with Buck Houghton. And I thought the subject for a story would really, really be good in, in, if it took place in the old folks' home. But I didn't have the magical element of the magical uh, tin can or the magical uh, ability. I didn't have that. And when I was talking with uh, Buck, it came up, the idea of, uh, yes, uh, what if the power of the game, children's games, was the real great, great secret? And so we started talking amongst and We got totally excited as we said, you know, I was totally raised by children. Almost everything I know I learned from my, my big brother or my kid sister. That I was, that all the real children's secrets. See, H. Ryder Haggard is absolutely right about that. And, and, and uh, even... Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson is right about that. I've read about in their writings where they, they hint at the secret world of children. The children have a, a mythology only, only of their own. Who taught me to play kick the can? Other children. No adult ever told, showed me how to, to make a top spin or how to do a yo-yo or, or how to shoot marbles and all that stuff. I learned it all. And most of my greatest wisdom, how to play a harmonica, I learned it from a kid. How to shoot marbles. I was a marble champion when I was a kid. I, I've started a short story about a kid who becomes sponsored by a group of people to become a marble champion. And, you know, my, my version of the Cincinnati kid, sort of only a, but with marbles. Because I could see the romance in it, and I could see that I could write about it, because it came out of my own experience. I had no experience with old folks' homes, but I do know of the affinity that I've learned from Bradbury between old people, old men and little boys, old people and children. They, old people become childlike. There's a certain kind of a magic about children, children's lore, children's magic, children's power, and the fact that we are all children. My mother was a third grade. She left school in the third grade. She married, and my oldest brother was married, was born when she was 18. My father knew nothing. He was had no education, maybe third or fourth grade education out of West Virginia, had escaped from the mines to join the army or else to go into the coal mines of West Virginia is not a good, pretty life to be stuck in those damn mines. And once you're in, you're in for life. It, and it's like being a galley slave. So 
with redneck parents who are basically sharecroppers and coal miners, no education, no one in my family ever had a nickel. The idea of inheritance in my family is silly. The idea of going to college in my family, silly. Although most of my sister's children have gone to college, my children, my daughters, uh, got a master's degree already, a great teacher. So, but one generation ago, undreamed of, and amongst my peers, my cousins, none of them ever went off and made anything of their lives at all because they had fairly uncomplicated lives that never provoked them to examine themselves, to examine their society, or to overcome injustice, to, to have forgiveness, to, to, to put aside resentment, to, to understand that the other person might have a point of view, you know, to be able to put yourself in the other guy's moccasins or to project yourself into his mind. Take the boys at the orphanage. There was Dickie Fink. Actually, that was his name, Dick Fink. There was Billy Solheim, and the kids called him Slime. Billy Slime. <laughs> he had a sister. There was Daniel Erickson and his brother, Frederick. D Daniel was mentally ill. He was lame mentally. He could be led around by his other brother. His brother was smart and could sort of handle him. The two of them were in the orphanage together. And others, mostly smaller than me. I was one of the older boys, but not old enough to move to the big boys who were in, uh, in charge of another group of people. I was still juvenile and not one of those 15, 16, 17-year-old boys that they had that would work in the big garden with the guy, who, the, the house father of that house whereas this house had house mothers, so I had a house mother. And it, one day you would wake up to see the shirt you were wearing yesterday being worn by another boy. And then next week it would be on another boy because they would just clean the boat clothes and then issue them in sizes. And so the boys who were my size would wear my clothes or wear the clothes, which were continually being recycled through the bay. You know, I learned how to take showers every day. I learned how to say yes, sir, and no, sir. Yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. How to eat without putting my elbows on the table. All manner of little things that later on served me in really good stead, because then when I wanted to fake being a college boy, I mean, the photograph on this thing here, that was the look that I had when I was a boy. And uh, this look was deliberately put together for this little way. I mean, the the button-down shirt that was your arm without the tie yeah to put a tie on would be to knuckle under to the game of being an employee but if you're going to be a writer then you can't see and to put on the glasses so that I would look intellectual and to be able to use the jargon so that everyone would consider me obviously a college bred boy although as I said in eighth grade drop out of school totally self-educated but educated by being brought up amongst all manner of families from total destitute families to very, very rich families so that I could learn how to to carry on in their environment and and uh, not stand out because that was the horrible thing when I was a child was to stand out. Now it's nothing. To fit in was the game in those days, to fit in. And yeah, I, could try to, I tried to fit in, Shell, but I never could. See, the thing is I was an outsider all of my life and to this very day continue to be perfectly prepared to stand on the outside and look in the window. But you created two new people for this world, and I don't think you wanted them to be outsiders or to go what you went through, did you? I mean, would, would, it would have pained you if your wife was an alcoholic and they had to go into an orphanage.